Okay, the uh, Lucerne Valley Johnson Valley Municipal Advisory Council is now in session at whatever time it is. 5.09. Uh, would you please stand and join us with a flag salute and David Rader, would you please lead us in the flag salute. Gentlemen, remove your hats. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You all may be seated. Okay, roll call. It looks like we're all here. We still have one vacancy on the board uh, to be filled by someone from Johnson Valley. Oh. Sorry about that. The roll call. Um, looks like everyone is here. We still have one vacancy on the board, and that uh, should be someone uh, from Johnson Valley. Next agenda item, approval of the agenda. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, abstain? Okay. Approval of minutes. Um, minutes from the regular meeting of, well, if I got the date wrong here, it looks like. Our last meeting. Um, August 16th. Yeah, August 16th. I make a motion to accept the minutes of August 16th, was it? Yes. Second. See, no matter how much I spell check, I get something wrong every time. You got, uh, uh, there was a motion made, was there a second? Yes. Okay, motion made and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, uh, our guest speakers tonight uh, is uh, uh, Brood Hancock, uh, Superintendent of Operations for County Solid Waste Management. Um, he, may, he has other folks with him, so... Um, if you, uh, Brad, Rude, if you'll take the microphone over there, and uh, you might, you're pretty tall, you might have to hold the microphone rather than just try to lean in. Sir. That should work. Okay. How's that? Okay. Well, first, thank you for inviting us to come up. We know that there's some questions and concerns about the transfer station. We want to uh, address those and. Um, uh, hear from the community. So just a little bit of background on the transfer station. The transfer station here, uh, the Camp Rock transfer station, is a land use only transfer station. It's, you've, as you're aware, it's not a scaled facility. It only takes the land use cards, the punch cards. And as a result of that, um, it's limited as to what types of waste it can take as compared to a landfill or another scaled site. Um, and those limitations are by ordinance. It's part of the fee ordinance that, uh, that establishes what we, can, what we can take. So those land use cards are limited to ordinary household waste. That's the, the letter that comes with them that, in, that informs everyone. Um, ordinary household waste. And what that's really defined as is basically it's the kind of waste that you're going to generate from the typical just day-to-day -day functions of a house, of a residence. Um, we don't take construction and demolition material, for example, like construction waste. Um, but we also realize that in the day-to-day -day functioning of a, of a house, you're going to generate, you know, a cut off piece of two by four or a small piece of drywall or what have you. So if it's a small thing and it can go inside your trash can, then that's considered incidental and, and that's perfectly acceptable. Where we have issues with that type of waste is where a truck load or a trailer load comes in and it's apparent that that's more commercial uh, originating. And so those waste loads will, would be rejected because we don't have either the room or the uh, authority, actually, to accept that waste. So um, 
Another issue that we have is at, at none of our sites can we accept household hazardous waste, for example, and we have um, representatives from the county fire marshal's office here, their household hazardous waste program, and they're going to have a presentation in a moment that will talk about household hazardous waste, why we don't accept it, and what alternatives are available to the community. Um, additionally, we know th at the site we have, in addition to just waste, to the household waste, we can take tires, we can take metal, we can take white goods like appliances, that type of thing, um, and we can take recyclables, cardboard and plastics and that. So they have individual bins at the facility that those types of items would be put into when they're, uh, when they're received. Um, typically, when you bring in a load to the facility, it's limited to a 500 pound load. And that's one punch on your card. But, as we know, um, if you have what, a, what is estimated to be more than 500 pounds, then they'll do a second punch. They just, they can't go forward in time, but if you have prior punches, so you have, this, this is September, if you have August punches that you didn't utilize, they can go back and they can punch those to make up for that extra waste that you have so you don't have to take it home and bring it back. So um, that's pretty much the operation of the, of the facility. So if there are questions. How many punches a year? You have, thank you. You have 52 punches per year on a card of your, your household waste. And then you have an additional 13 punches of um, what's, on the letter it's described as flammable material. It, it's yard waste. It's clippings, tree trimmings, that kind of thing. But you have to, uh, that, that again is limited to what would be typical of a residence. It wouldn't be a landscaper bringing in his trailer full of uh, palm fronds or what have you. It would be uh, limited to what would be typically generated in the function of a house. I know they're going to bring it up too, but I, I want everybody to remember. My, oh, sorry. I just want everybody to remember uh, you and you guys and uh, everyone to remember that what does not is not accepted at the transfer station ends up in the desert. Now, everyone that lives in the Cern Valley, one of the reasons we live out here, now none of us are really environmental wackos or anything, but we cherish our environment out here. We want a nice, clean desert. And so when you turn away that guy that has a questionable load, whether he should or shouldn't dig it, you turn him away, you think he's going to Barstow? He is not. He's either going up Crystal Creek Road, farther out Camp Rock, over here by uh, uh, Lucerne Dry Lake, or there's a bunch of places around here they will dump it illegally. And when it comes to hazardous wa household waste, Hazard or hazardous waste, paint, varnish, uh, old gasoline, all that, then we really got a problem. And, and I, I know you're going to talk about it, but if it's not readily available to take it somewhere, it's going to get dumped in the desert. They're not taking it home. We, I've lived here since 1982. Millie's lived here all her life. And, uh, and, and the rest of us lived here a long time. And we know that that is an absolute truth. Now, what does not taken at the transfer station ends up in the desert. Um, so my question is, what would it take to upscale the transfer station to where it can take more things? I know it would require trained individuals. Anybody could be trained to handle hazardous waste. It's not that you don't need a college degree to handle hazardous waste. Um, and just a facility set up to accept it. Um, and I know you might have to go back and modify your state permit and all that, but Really, that's really the direction has to be gone. I wish uh, somebody from uh, Obernolte's office came to this meeting, but it might, you know, if you have trouble with the state, maybe he can intervene and help get that permit changed. And, and I know the Board of Supervisors would have to buy off on it. But just remember this, from Lucerne Valley, and I'm sure other desert communities, what doesn't go to the transfer station ends up dumped illegally in the desert. There's no other alternative. People don't take it home. So there's any other questions from the board before we turn it over to the rest of the uh, public? Well, my question was related, and maybe now it's a statement, but what he's saying is true. 
And in fact, we live on Clark and Highland, which is maybe a mile from here as the crow flies, and we're seeing a lot of dumping on Clark between Highland and Crystal Creek. That's right a half mile from the center of town. People are dumping yard waste, old tires, a tire rim, mattresses. So my question to the county is, you're doing what works with from the top down. It, it, you're not doing what works for us little guys, for us deplorables. What works, we, we need service at a level that the people will use it. And I know there's some controversy about this, but some of us would like to see the transportation much closer to the center of town. It's ridiculous where it is. And what can the county do to address these issues that he mentioned and that I mentioned? Well, thank you. But a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm f well, I'm not from Yucca Valley, but I've lived in Yucca Valley for 20 years. So I'm, I'm, I consider myself one of your neighbors. I lived two miles from the Landers Landfill. The Landers Landfill is as, as permitted as any disposal site in the county. Um, as far as, it, it has no more limitations than, than Mid Valley at, in, in Rialto, at our, our main disposal site. But, but it does have limitations. And those limitations, and, and um, Mr. Philippe, Jason Philippe from our local enforcement agency, he's here, um, he's gonna come up in just a second, and he'll address the permitting constraints that we have, because, because they are real, and, and it isn't just a matter of, of going down and telling them that this is what we're going to do. Um, but one issue that I've noticed, being from Yucca Valley, with, with the Landers landfill, we still have trash that's thrown out of vehicles just on the side of the road, on the side of Avalon, less than a mile from the landfill. And it's trash that that landfill takes. In fact, today on my way, I, before I came here, I went to the Camp Rock transfer station and I saw three bags of, of trash on Camp Rock. The station's open and it was just white kitchen trash bags full of trash. The, the issue is not restricted to those items that our waste disposal sites don't accept. The issue is, I believe, a mindset. And if, the, if, if we took everything, if we took everything in the world, we have closing hours. Somebody's gonna show up at the landfill or at the transfer station after closing hours, and the same rule would apply. I've got it in my car, I drove all the way over here, I'm not taking this back home. So I'm gonna get rid of it on my way, on my way home. I'm gonna take it out into the desert or I'm just gonna pull over on a wide spot of the street and I'm gonna throw it out and somebody else's problem at that point. So by, by, this, by, the, by the logic that we're, that we're applying, we would have to stay open 24 hours a day and we'd have to accept everything in order not to have people dispose of things in the, in the desert. So that obviously isn't a viable solution. So the, the real solution is educating the public. Um, enforcement, and I know that the sheriff and code enforcement do as much enforcement as they can, but they do as much as they can. Um, the problem, I, I think, more than even in, than, than enforcement comes down to education. We have to educate people as to what are their alternatives. From, from this point right here, from, from here, I Googled it uh, this afternoon before I came. From here, it's 10 miles to the, to the Camp Rock transfer station. It's 30 miles to the Barstow landfill. That's 20 extra miles. It's 26 miles, I was surprised. It's only 26 miles to the Victorville landfill. Uh, that is 16 miles further than going to the transfer station. Those items that the transfer station, and yes, it isn't, a, it, of course, it's not a perfect solution, the, the transfer station in a perfect world, you know, we, we, we would all have flux capacitors and they would burn up all of our trash and we wouldn't have to worry about it. But where we stand though, is that we do have 
regional landfills and we tra have transfer stations that feed them and we have regulations that are imposed upon us by the state that tells us what we can and cannot accept. And it, it isn't a matter of, well, we just don't feel like doing it. It's a matter of there, they are specific regulations that are in place and we just fall within those regulations. So and I'd like to invite Jason up and he can. Okay, I just have one comment before you get down though. That, and maybe we'll take some questions for you real quick uh, from the audience, but um, oh, now I forgot my train of thought. Well, let's open up the audience and maybe, um, maybe Melly, go ahead, stand up and say your. But most of, most of the time, um, we still have a mattress in our yard, which we could call the we could call the waste company, and they would do a special pickup. We just haven't done that yet. But a lot of times we get stuck, and we have to drive all the way out to Barstow to dispose of it. So, if in cases like that, we do, um, we do town cleanups. Is there is there a way to get a waiver for those big items? Um, so that we don't have to drive that far. We're already driving, well, we've been driving all over the desert, then we have to drive another 10 miles out, 10 miles back. So that was my question. Well, uh, as far as a waiver of the fees, unfortunately, nobody's allowed to waive the fees. The fees are established and we can't waive the fees, but um, code enforcement does periodic community cleanups, and I, I would assume, I don't know, I don't work for code enforcement, and I hesitate to speak for code enforcement, but it would be a good conversation to have with code enforcement to see if, if maybe some coordination between your group and them would be beneficial so that they might be able to provide one of their dumpsters uh, roll-offs. And that would be a place, and, and you could get a little, maybe a little bit more community uh, input into that. We used to have two cleanups a year, and the average was nine bins of tires, five bins of furniture, and uh, we had townspeople that would take the metal. And I wondered if what it costs you now to, to clean up around here, now that we don't have the cleanup. I think the last one was in 2012, and people would collect stuff everywhere. I, I think that I can probably help with that. I can have code enforcement coordinate a community cleanup and bring some bins out here. I just need your permission to put you on the list and a contact. They can contact for an area they want to put it. Usually they'll put the bin here at the community center. Pardon? Well, they do it at the, okay, they do it at the store. And I can coordinate that for you if you'd like and get you on the list. And that would be advertised. You could put flyers out and such and people can save their material until that day. and. Uh, Specify how many bins you think you're going to need. We'll start out with one huge rollback and go from there. Of October is I'm our not, next cleanup, so I don't think that's probably enough time to get them well, to do that. Well, I'll try. Is it the 12th? I'll absolutely try. The 12th. I'm told that that's the 12th. That's okay. pretty close. 13th. Probably won't get that one, but uh, we'll try it as soon as we possibly can, and I will get Roger the information, and they, he can get it out to the MAC. Okay, and Millie, you might, guys, after the meeting, you guys change phone numbers, and you can directly coordinate with you on make this thing happen? I have a big question. Now, everybody who owns property gets these little punch cards you send out. But what about when they rent these houses out and the landlords do not give the card to the people who they're renting the homes to. They cannot take the stuff to the dump. What about going back to the way it used to be 
a utility bill, you know, your gas or electric bill showing you actually live on that property. What was wrong with that? Now we get trash all over the place, like you said. You saw two bags of white trash. You know, we got all kinds of people who can't afford to continue driving to Victorville or Barstow to take the big stuff. There is one guy that comes to these meetings all the time. He lives one mile from the dump out there on, I can't remember the name of the road, and he's doing some yard work and building, you know, brick walls and everything else. And they told him to take it to Barstow. He says, I only live a mile from here. But it happens to be broken bricks and stuff, and the guy said, no, you can't have it. But what he's going to do? I mean, he's not going to go down the street. He took it back home. He has a big pile of it now. So, you know, cut us some slack. We well, appreciate it. And I, I don't, to, to be real frank, I don't know what the impetus was for changing from one method to another. Um, I do know that we're in the in the process of upgrading the way that our, our those punch cards are and getting rid of the punch cards and going more like a debit type of a thing that's more permanent and um, that doesn't fix the problem that you're talking about. The, the letter that does come out though with those cards, it, it does talk about that if you have a tenant, give your card to your tenant because it's the, it's the owner or the resident who can use the card. That's the intent of it. So again, that, that's education and, and maybe we can add a little extra blurb in our, in our letter that reminds people that if they have a tenant, they should pass the card on to their tenant. The gentleman back there with a the red shirt and a half. Yeah, what happens with the people who have, who have multiple multiple rental properties? Then what? Every they don't. No, they don't. Every the one per one person owns the property, and these are all rental properties. Oh. They're, they're, they're issued one print punch card per per, every, per owner. Every APN that's developed for residential use should get a card if there's a if there's a property that doesn't then they should check with the assessor's office because our our mailing list that we use to send out the cards comes to us from the as the assessor's office we don't maintain the the addresses or anything like that so so if anybody does have that situation they should check and make sure that they that the assessor has their accurate mailing address well Robert okay like myself my sister owns the property. Actually, I own it with her, but her name is on it. She's in Fresno. And by the time I get it, it's already halfway through the year. And they're traveling now. And it's, last time we went up there, we were told we couldn't hear of certain things. And I go, wait a minute, this is underneath that. If they wouldn't let us, they told us to go to Barstow. I'm not going to go to Barstow. I'm sorry. We pay for this uh, tax or whatever you, for it. I don't think, you know, I should have to go to Barstow. I'm Lucerne Valley. So, so if, I, if I understand what you're saying, you had something that was in the load that wasn't allowed, but other things in the load on top of that that were, and they rejected the whole load. I don't know how long ago that was few months ago well I know that we had a we had some a, a bit of an issue the our contractor Athens services they were very uh, responsive and when we heard about those issues they have a new site attendant at at Camp Rock now and we I haven't heard additional um, issues since then because what should happen in your case the, the case that you described you should be able to unload that material that is acceptable and just take what wasn't back with you. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, and and I hate to sound <laughs> trite, but unfortunately we we can't accept those items that we can't accept the, the the items that are not that we're not permitted to accept we just can't accept them because if we do his department comes and they issue us a, a violation 
And if we get a certain number of violations, we get closed and w there is no transfer station. Okay, now we're Lucerne Valley, we mm -hmm. pay for what we get. And there should be something close to us that we should be able to take these things instead of going further away. You understand? I, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. okay. If Barstow can take more stuff than Lucerne Valley. I realize it's, it's a landfill. The Cern Valley is a transfer station. There's lots of room out there. I can't imagine a permit couldn't be modified from the state state to take construction debris and and just have extra bins out there. Now maybe it would require a scale and maybe it would require a charge, but we have to do something. We really got to come up with some kind of plan to to uh, to cut back on this. There'll always be illegal dumping. I'm not under any illusion that there won't be, but we we have we really got to do something. And and really the. The, the, the inability to accept construction and demolition debris is not a, is, that, that really isn't a function of the permit, although our permit does, does not allow it. You're right. If we were set up to accept it, but in order to set up, to be set up to accept it, we would have to put in a scale. We would have to have a scale operator. We would have, and that isn't what, the, the, the station by and large is functioning as it's intended to. It, and I understand that it isn't, it's not perfect, it's, it's not perfect, but it would also cease to be a land use only site. As soon as the scale went in, then it's a pay as you go site. And that then creates other issues. So the, the site is functioning though for the community as it was intended to function, which is to accept regular household waste. The, the issues that we're having with illegal dumping is the, the two big things were construction and demolition debris, and which is typically contractors. Um, I don't think, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that most of the residents are loading their trailers with pieces of broken drywall and concrete and two by fours and, and that. That, that, that's contractor type uh, waste. And that's stuff that needs to go to the, needs to go 16 miles further down the road that way or 20 miles further down the road that way and go, go to the landfill. Um, household hazardous waste though, we can't accept at any of our sites. And even if we got a site that was permitted, it would not be able to be on the same property as the transfer station. The transfer station can never have, can, can never be permitted to accept household hazardous waste. But I'm stepping on their toes now. So. Are there any more questions from the audience? We need to move along here. Uh, Roger, could we hear the rest of the presentation before we have any more questions? Yes. Sure, but I wanted to catch him while he was up here. So. Okay, let's move on to the next presenter. Okay, so Jason Philippe, he is the program director for our local enforcement agency with environmental health, and he'll basically explain the permit constraints that we have to operate within. Uh, hello, everybody. I, um, I don't have... Um, 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 a presentation, uh, but I just wanted to explain a little bit like what uh, Brood was saying. Um, uh, the, the state of California is very prescriptive in, in what it considers um, to be solid waste. Um, household uh, hazardous waste, you know, uh, therefore can't be accepted at a solid waste facility. Um, it would have to be um, a separate operation. Um, and so that's why at this transfer station, they, they do have to turn everything away. Uh, that is, um, is defined um, as household hazardous waste or that is not uh, defined as solid waste. Now, um, as far as the, as the permitting process goes, uh, permits are, are written in a sense that they, again, um, are very pres uh, prescriptive. So solid waste has to write uh, and document exactly the, the operation they are going to have at their transfer station. Everything from the amount of staff they have to the hours of operation, to uh, the volume of material, um, and they cannot exceed that. And as the, the local enforcement agency, we're required to enforce those state laws. Um, and in that sense, we don't have um, a lot of flexibility in what we can allow 
uh, a transfer station to do. So they would have to go through a, a permitting process um, and a permit amendment if they did want to change what they did. But um, as you all know, um, you know, things like that do involve a cost. Uh, um, they can trigger um, environmental impact reviews and things like that when you begin exceeding what you had planned to do uh, and you want to um, amend your, your permit to, to change your activities. So um, I just wanted to explain that. If anyone had any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and then after that, um, I'll, give it, I'll give it over to our, our, our hazardous waste uh, folks to give their presentation. So does anyone have any questions? So you indicated that a, a permit can be modified? Is that what I heard, understood you to say? I, I, yeah, permits can be amended. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ladies? All right, and please introduce yourselves, too. I think, I, I think we had one more question here. I've got several spray cans. They're empty. Some of them are sold. They won't spray. If I turn them in here now, do I have to use my permit to, that I go to the dump with? Uh, I'm not sure uh, which category that would end up in. Um, yeah. Yes. So all these little pens that don't spray anymore, they're just locked in. I just have to take them out to Bill's house and put them on a grill. No, I wouldn't suggest that. Uh, I believe the fire department on the third Saturday of each month does but collect. I use my dump car to bring it to the fire department. Well, no, you don't need your dump car to take that to the fire department. That's your option. Can you kill a lot? Kill a couple lot. Good evening, my name is Monica Ronchetti and I am the supervisor at the Household Hazardous Waste Program in San Bernardino County and with me is Ione Wallace, she's our Deputy Fire Marshal and she oversees both uh, the Household Hazardous Waste Division and the Hazmat Division. It's not working? This won't work? Okay. Sorry, our, our projector is not working correctly. Uh, so, so unfortunately, I can't show you any of the pictures that I have. Um, so the Household Hazardous Waste Program in San Bernardino County, we have 14 permanent Household Hazardous Waste facilities. And then we also have uh, three recycle-only types of facilities. These are called ABOP facilities. And that's what Lucerne Valley is. It's an ABOP facility. So they only accept... Uh, antifreeze, batteries, which are household batteries and automotive batteries, motor oil and used oil filters, and latex paint. They also accept uh, electronic waste, fluorescent lamps, and home-generated sharps. So the, um, the household hazardous waste, it's defined in the California Health and Safety Code under Section 25218.1e. And it, what it says is that household hazardous waste is hazardous waste generated incidental to owning or maintaining a place of residence, and it does not include business waste. Uh, so we do have a small business program 
uh, it's under, it's called the conditionally exempt small quantity generator and as long as a business generates no more than 27 gallons or 220 pounds of hazardous waste they can qualify to use this program but the only location uh, that is permitted to uh, to accept this types type of waste is the San Bernardino location yes that's for business waste because uh, most businesses should be using their uh, a, a hazardous waste hauler. Uh, so our 14 permanent facilities, they're located throughout the county. We have uh, one in Barstow, Apple Valley, Hesperia, uh, and then also in the lower parts of the county, um, in Joshua Tree, in San Bernardino. Oh, there we, there we go. Um, Yeah, kind of. No? All right. Well, uh, and so and then we also have uh, facilities that are in Rancho Cucamonga, Ontario, Upland, Rialto, uh, and Barstow, just all over the county. Uh, the Lucerne Valley, the Lucerne Valley ABOP facility is open on the third Saturday of the month and it's open from 9 to 12 p.m. and it is run by volunteers so it is dependent on the availability of those volunteers for it to be open. Uh, we do have a permanent, I'm sorry, we do have a temporary collection event which is a one-time event where we do accept all household hazardous waste at the Lucerne facility, and that's usually in March. Uh, and it's going for now. Right. Keep going if, if you can. So we are mandated also by the state uh, to provide a household hazardous waste program for residents, and which we do, uh, and but we do we are subject to the state's requirements also so we can uh we have to have trained staff which we do train the volunteers i come up here once a year and i train all the volunteers that work the abot facility um, and we can only um, accept up to 15 gallons or 125 pounds per trip of household hazardous waste from the residents. But you can come as many times as you want in that time that we're, that we're open. Um, but uh, that is the transportation limit that, um, that the state sets. So uh, household hazardous waste, the reason why it is, um, it is banned from the landfill, like, um, Brad was saying, uh, and Jason, it is banned from the landfill because it uh, can cause a threat to human health, the environment, and it's also uh, a threat, a safety concern for the sanitation workers who work the landfills uh, and the transfer station because household hazardous waste, if it's commingled, it can cause fire, explosions, you know, toxic gas. Uh, and many, many of the common household products that you use, they are illegal to dispose of in the trash, down the drain, or abandoned, of course, on the side of the road. So they do have to go through a household hazardous waste facility. Here's the list of all our permanent household hazardous waste facilities. So the closest permanent would be Apple Valley or Hesperia to this site here. Uh, like I said, though, we do have a one annual uh, temporary collection event in which we do accept all household hazardous waste and it is advertised in your local paper uh, these are just uh, some of our uh, other facilities that we have someone mentioned earlier about what it would take to uh, build a facility whether it's a uh, solid waste or household waste. So you're talking about like a million to three million dollars because it has to be built to state specification. So um, you notice Big Bear Lake facility, we had one there a while back. We um, 
work with the city to, to modify the facility for it to, to look like it should look legally. Um, Upland and the other bottom end is another uh, smaller facility, but um, it, it does take money for siting and environmental impact report and uh, disposal and staff training and it's, um, it can be done, it just costs money. And, and uh, the uh, Lucerne Valley ABOP facility, it is located, it's just right over here behind the fire station across from the park. Uh, and you can go ahead and go to the next one. And here's some pictures of the, the actual household hazardous waste event that we do have here in Lucerne. Sorry, Lucerne Valley. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And go ahead. Okay, and, and then these are just other areas that we also hold temporary one-day collection events. And then we do, like I said, take uh, home-generated sharps, but they do have to be in an approved sharps container. We can't take them in bags or water bottles or coffee cans, anything like that. But you can get an approved container from the, um, from the site, from the Lucerne Valley site. Uh, it is limited to one per, per person. Uh, per resident, but you can pick one up, you can dispose of your sharps just bring, and bring that back to us. Go ahead. Uh, these are things that we do not take at our household hazardous waste facility, which includes uh, business waste, appliances, furnitures, ex furniture explos um, explosives, tires, medical waste, reactives, radioactive waste, asbestos, and yard waste. So what happens when has household hazardous waste is disposed of in the trash? This is what happens. Um, it does react and it can catch on fire. Like I said, uh, it can cause toxic gas. We've had that issue before where it was commingled and it created a toxic cloud which uh, endangered some of our employees. So um, if you want more information, that's our number at 1-800-OILY-CAT, or you can find us on sbcfire.org. Any questions? It's same place, right across over here. Yep, right behind the fire station. Uh, usually, I, I believe it's still 9 to 12. Yeah. And the, and the third Saturday of each month is based solely on the, the amount of people that show up to help. Yes. So there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. Yeah, it, it, it usually does, right. but, but if somebody, it, we have to have at least two staff there, uh, two volunteers, uh, and if, you know, somebody does not show up or is sick, then yes, there's a chance that it could not be open. Okay, your oil and other stuff. Uh -huh. like, there's one can that's been sitting at my place for years. It's a can about this big. Grandparents filled it with oil and I think it's called, uh, what's the other thing that comes out of a car? Um, and it freeze. They're mixed together. Yeah. I can't lift it. How do I go about this? Uh, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you do have to get it to our facility because we don't have a pickup service. Yeah. Um, if you can, you know, find somebody to help you. It, it does. We don't have a, you know, a door-to-door -door door service. Oh, here's Chuck. Hazardous waste team here in Lucerne Valley. And I understand Donnie is going to volunteer her husband to help us. <laughs> That's why we only can do it every two months, sometimes every three months, depending upon schedules. So it's not the third Saturday. But if somebody has a load that they cannot bring, we got a phone number, I'll come pick it up. Okay. No big deal. And well, if it's let, let's let's just say that let's just say that uh, <laughs> the county when the county comes up in March, Robin, 
they'll take just about everything. Okay. Thank God for that. And if we didn't yeah. have that, we'd be in trouble. We are confined to exactly what she said. But if something ends up in the back of my truck that we cannot technically take, it's going to go out in the barrel behind the fire, you know, behind the uh, our, our module is there. Yeah. And it'll be picked up and, and I'll notify yeah. Michael and yeah. we'll Thank take you. care of it. But I think that if you saw the facilities that we have to work with, and it's not all their fault, 80% of the stuff is because of the state of California. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's yeah, pretty yeah. complex. Can, okay. And so um, moving that is not an option. And anything but volunteers doing that is not an option. And as far as the other stuff, um, I've used the dump when it was a dump. Yeah. Much, much more fun back then. You know, it's constantly burning. We told visitors, well, that's our volcano. We don't know when it's going to go. Then it went to a transportation. I've never had a problem with it. Um, thank God that we worked hard to get tires there and other recyclables, and they did it. Or their, they the, uh, either solid waste or Athens or Burkett, whoever was the contractor. Um, if you, and we really do thank you for the tires. That's a big help. If we move this anywhere else in town, it's not going to make a difference. We have our demographics of the problem in terms of illegal dumping in lots of county. And we complain right now about the fire tax. Okay, if we're complaining about the fire tax, are we going to start complaining about the millions of dollars it takes to move this thing somewhere else? It's a perfectly good location out there. And I, I really think that um, I had a roofing job. I knew I couldn't take it there. I didn't particularly want to drive the bar so I just rented a, uh, a bird tech dumpster and put it in there and they picked it up and when I was done with it, I canceled it out and I go to the dump and they'll take all the recyclables. I think we need to thank these guys for what they have added to that and let's not harass them. Absolutely. Roger, can I make a statement? Uh, okay, we've well, got a few other. Go ahead, make your statement. Uh, we found out in certain areas, maybe not so much in this area, but in the unincorporated areas, especially that are doing some, some major building and rehabs of their uh, houses and such, they're hiring contractors. Maybe some contractors are not very scrupulous, but they're taking their construction material as part of the job The people pay them and they are supposed to take it to the dump. Well, they don't. They, they take the money that's allocated for the dump and they put it in their pocket and they dump it in the desert. We found out that's happening a lot. If you've got a contractor that part of his pay is disposing of that property or that waste, either follow him to the, to the station in Barstow, if you don't have any uh, facility to haul it or don't have a vehicle to haul it, and make sure that it gets into the facility and dumped, or make him go to the dump and pay for it before you pay him and get, have him bring a receipt back before you pay him. That has helped tremendously in some areas on this illegal dumping. Because the, some of the, like I say, the contractors are doing that. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, Rude, go ahead. I just had a question for Monica. The, the, the site here, the collection center is staffed by volunteers, yes. but its ability to open is limited by the number of volunteers. You said you do the training. Yes. How often, could you, and I think you said once a year. But yes, once a year. How much does that cost? And if somebody wants to, to become a volunteer, someone in the community so that they can help staff it, what, what's the process? What do they have to do? Uh, they can just contact me and they have to fill out uh, uh, some forms through our county HR uh, to become a volunteer and also uh, they do a, um, a small background check uh, you have to get fingerprinted uh, and then you have to be trained so then you have to be trained uh, in order to work the site but it's there's no cost No, it's 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 done through our county HR program. What what I would do if you if you want to contact me, you can contact me, uh, and then I would give her your information, and she would contact you to find to send it to you. Let me know, and I'll get the connection made. Yeah, or you can Chuck does a lot of uh, he he 
gets the volunteers and he sends all that information to me usually. So. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming all the way up here. We really appreciate it. And Bruce, thank you also. And uh, forgot his name sitting next to you. <laughs> Jason. Jason, thank you guys. At this time, we'll start our public comment uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, uh, members of the public wishing to address the council will be asked during this section of the agenda if they have an issue to bring to the attention of the council, which is not an item on the agenda. By raising the hands, the chairman will ask any, any individual to address the council at this time. Please honor the three-minute three minute time limit when addressing the council and complete thoughts quickly. Um, uh, all testimony given before the council may, may be recorded. Since council discussion of an item is not uh, on the posted agenda, it is not allowed. These concerns may be addressed in, in a future meeting as soon as practical under non-action items uh, for non-action items and, and action items. The public will be given an opportunity to speak during the discussion of each item. The speakers wish to pass material to the council, please hand it to the recording secretary for distribution. Legal, political, legislative, claims against the county, campaign, court issues, and family law issues are not appropriate discussion for the MAC consideration. With that said, is there anyone from the public who would like to address the council? Go, go ahead. The uh, question is, you have down on the agenda non-action item discussion of the proposed county fire to weigh in on that yes absolutely so we don't have to do that now no you can't do that now we okay. have to wait till that item a non-action item comes up anything else for the council okay we'll go on to our report section i'll start out with san Bernardino county sheriff Thanks again, folks, for coming. Right, good evening, everybody. Sergeant Rodriguez from the Sheriff's Department. This will be the report for the month of August. So it's August 1st through the 31st. Apple Valley County area, we had 466 calls for service with 44 reports taken. Lucerne Valley area, we had 548 calls for service with 58 reports taken. Had a busy month in August. I'm not going to give you all the details like I did at La Vida. There's too much to go through. So I'll just uh, make it brief. Uh, we had a lot of complaints to reference the internet cafes. So while we were doing our investigation, DOJ contacted us. They were doing a parallel investigation. Uh, so we went out with them, and they advised the owner to close both Internet cafes due to illegal gambling. Uh, the owner complied and closed both locations the following day. So if you notice, those two businesses are both closed. Uh, we also had the marijuana team come out due to all the complaints for the marijuana grows that uh, we were seeing. So on uh, Friday, August 24th, and also on the 31st, uh, the marijuana team came out uh, also with some of the deputies from the Victor Valley Station. And they served search warrants at residents in an unincorporated area of Lucerne Valley. Uh, there were five houses that they went to. Uh, all five had outdoor marijuana cultivations on the property, over 2,661 marijuana plants, and 444 pounds of processed marijuana were seized during these search warrants. A total of 25 suspects were arrested out of the five locations. Uh, marijuana team doesn't believe any of these were linked together like they were the same person operating all of them uh, or any of them together. 
and this is from their press release, the investigation revealed the marijuana cultivations were not in compliance with the California Medical and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act and or the San Bernardino County's ordinance prohibiting commercial cannabis activity. San Bernardino County has an ordinance prohibiting commercial cannabis activity, which includes growing marijuana plants outdoors. San Bernardino County Code Enforcement personnel will assist in the notifications to the property owners to make them aware of the violations occurring on their property. The Sheriff's Gang Narcotic Division will continue to enforce California cannabis laws as well as San Bernardino County ordinances regarding cannabis cultivation and distribution. Persons found guilty of violating the law and county ordinance are subject to fines, prosecution, and seizure of property. Property owners who are growing marijuana or are aware their tenants are growing marijuana on their properties in violation of these state laws and local ordinances may also be subject to civil or criminal sanctions. Property owners are encouraged to contact law enforcement or code compliance agencies to confirm if cultivation of cannabis is prohibited or allowed under specific regulations. And I'll, I'll briefly go over the addresses that uh, they went to. So on Friday, August 24th, they went to the 39100 block of Sage Road. Uh, there they is where they seized 665 plants and arrested two people. That same day, they stopped by an address at the 39,000 block of East End Road. They contacted two subjects there uh, and advised them of that marijuana grow. They apparently ran out of time to, to serve their search warrant. Uh, so they just advised those subjects that it was illegal and those subjects cleared their lot the next day. So that, that got them out of the neighborhood. And on Friday, August 31st, they hit two houses that were right next door to each other, the 9700 block of Midway Avenue. One residence, they recovered 573 marijuana plants and made four arrests from that house. The house next door, they had 765 marijuana plants and 82 pounds of processed marijuana and two suspects were arrested from that residence. Uh, 38,000 block of East End Road, uh, they seized 215 marijuana plants and arrested one subject there. 9400 block of Black Hawk Trail, 443 marijuana plants were seized, 362 pounds of processed marijuana were seized, and that's where they arrested 16 suspects out of that house. So if anyone has any information regarding any of these investigations or if you know where there's some marijuana grows they haven't hit yet, you can always contact the Sheriff's Gang Narcotic Division and I'll put out the phone number and their email address for you guys. So their, their phone number is 909-387-8400. And then their email address, I'll spell it out. It's N-A-R-C hyphen M-E-T at sbcsd.org. You can also call the WeTip hotline if you want to remain anonymous. Upcoming events. Um, we're going to have some major construction done on our station due to some plumbing issues. Uh, so we may have to close the station for a couple of weeks. We will uh, continue to have deputy uh, patrol service out here during the construction. Uh, we're just going to be kind of working out of our units and hopefully a piece of the station will still be open so we can access computers uh, to do some of the work there. Uh, but that'll be put out on a press release when we do shut down for, for the period of time we'll be closed down. Any questions? Are you expanding the office at all? No, sir. I would like to have a question, and not necessarily pertaining to the marijuana, but about two weeks ago on Palomar and Fair Lane, there was a sheriff's helicopter that would probably land in our yard. We never did know what was going on, but we're sure curious. It was quite a lot of action going on. I mean, they were so low, they could have actually landed in the yard. And I was wondering if you have any information on that, or can you give you any information? I don't have any information on that. I wasn't that was aware. weird. Yeah, they may have been assisting Highway Patrol on something, um, but I'm not aware of what was going on. It was, it was, it was kind of scary and weird, but, but thank you anyway. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Wednesday, actually yesterday. No, was it, or was it Sunday? I think it was Sunday. About two o'clock, there were on high road. There were two ambulances parked in the middle of the road with their lights on, and there wasn't anybody anywhere. No people, no nothing. And they were there for about two hours. Do you know anything about that? 
I sure don't. I was weird. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I've had a couple people come by the chamber office the last couple of weeks asking if we knew anything about anyone dumping people here. There's been quite a few single guys walking through the center of town, which is not illegal, but I've had two people ask, and since then I've noticed quite a bit more traffic, like single guys walking. Yeah, I don't and know. And they seem to be in like regulation clothes, like they were just released from somewhere. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I do not. I know we okay. have some halfway houses and parole uh, houses out here, so uh -huh. that may be where they're coming from. Okay. That's what I'll report back. Yes, sir. If I come up to your office and knock on the door, why doesn't somebody answer the door? There may not be somebody inside when you're doing There's, that. I've knocked on the door. No, there are people in there. Okay. There's a doorbell right next to our front door. So, so, so if somebody isn't in the front uh, office by the lobby, you ring that doorbell and they'll be able to hear it in the back of the building. They will answer the door. Some of Yes, if you push the doorbell during our business hours. Yes, ma'am. Is it on? Okay. We had a situation in my neighborhood, which I live up around Highway 18, Visalia, and Richard Street. There's a gentleman up there. Well, he's not a gentleman. There's a person that lives up there that owns some pistachios, and he's been firing off a propane cannon to keep the crows out of his grove. I understand the cannon's legal, but this man has been firing off that cannon at midnight, 11 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 this morning. Who do I call to put this man um, away or have him stop doing that well you could you call us and we'll go out and talk to him if it's happening after the, the normal hours I believe it's from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. is when they can shoot off those cannons to scare it's the 11 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning okay. yeah you can call us and let us know if what's you your number out there well, not me personally you can call our dispatch center <laughs> it, it'll take me over call an hour to get out call here the anyways. local station C call our dispatch center okay not 911 no Okay. Uh, not an emergency. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> At 4 o'clock in the morning, it is. This has been going on now for about a month, steadily. Right. And we thought we had it handled because we turned it into the, uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's alcohol, tobacco, and drug place. When a man there was working on it. Yeah. But um, he said he couldn't do it. It had to be done by the local enforcement yeah. if if we if we get out there and we don't hear the cannon going off or you can't see who was shooting the cannon off uh, i don't know if it's set on a timer or if it has to be physically activated um we can only go out there and warn them about it if you want to call code enforcement they can do more enforcement on it so yes i'm going to call them too their, their ordinance yes okay yeah it's it's really bad it's really bad. We have a number of neighbors there that are upset about it. So I'm going to tell them all to call code enforcement and the local office. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We, well, we hope they're asleep at night. <laughs> no other questions then. We'll move on then. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. You're welcome. San Bernardino County Fire, you're up. <laughs> He's coming. My name is uh, Captain John Borowski with San Bernardino County Fire Department, <clears throat> assigned to Station 8. Uh, I'm here to present the activity report for August, and I'll answer the question about the, uh, <laughs> the ambulances on High Road. Um, 
what happened was we had a medical aid um, up in that area. The ambulance went to the medical aid. They assessed the, uh, the, the person that called. They actually had the person in the back of the ambulance when they had catastrophic failure of the uh, bands holding the gas tank on the ambulance. Basically, so the, so the fuel tank just dropped with a patient in the back. And um, obviously, they were out of service at that point. So we, um, Lucerne Valley has a reserve ambulance at Station 7 on Do uh, Doty. So we went and got that. Uh, we got another ambulance from Asperia that takes 20 minutes to transfer the patient. Um, so we had to wait. The ambulance had to wait on scene with the disabled ambulance and the one that they transferred over to um, before they could leave the scene. They were, they were there. The vehicles weren't by themselves. Uh, yes, as far as I know. As far as I know. So I don't know if that's um, something I should have made public. But yeah, so it was, it was just one of those things. It, it was a freak uh, deal and um, doesn't happen very often. All right, so Station 8 had 75 calls for service uh, in August. 80% on average are for medical responses. Uh, no major significant events as far as, you know, big fires or major accidents, just the, the typical. The fire station room addition is still on track to be completed within the, uh, the next month. Uh, they're adding two uh, additional rooms. So the underground's been done, so we should uh, look forward to moving in probably by Halloween, hopefully. Um, there, there has been no disruption to the station, so we're still functioning out of the station. They're doing most of the work um, to the exterior. All right. Uh, yeah, no staffing changes or equipment purchases. Uh, Chuck Bell just let me know that they're, they are going to have a collection uh, for the ABOT site on August 27th. October 27th. I'm sorry. August is well, well past. Yeah, oh, it'll be next year, so you guys have to hold on to your waist. Um, I'm supposed to go on vacation here in a couple days. I'm just kind of... My mind's a different place. Uh, we cannot receive any FP5 uh, petitions or responses at the fire station. They have to be um, dealt with accordingly. Uh, they have to go either through the mail or, or to an administrative office. So we can't, um, we can't receive any of those at the fire station. The open fire suspension is still in effect until further notice. It's just uh, fire season's still here. Um, you know, until we get significant rain, it's... Uh, there's going to be no tumbleweed burning until that happens. That's pretty much all I got. Anybody has any concerns, questions, comments about our level of service or lack of or Millie? <laughs> I do have a question. About a week ago, we saw black smoke coming off of um, the dry lake bed look like out here in the cove area, like off of Kendall. That, um, I think the sergeant has information on that. We did have a little vegetation fire behind the Dollar General. Um, that was middle of the afternoon. It was going pretty good, but I don't know if... No, this one, this one was... Way back. Way, way out. Yeah. Sergeant, what, what do you got on that? That was our, uh, one of our patrolling units caught fire that burned the Oh, there you go. <laughs> wow. Wow, okay. Well, our ambulance didn't catch on fire, so that was a good thing. Um. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Why do we need two fire departments? Well, that's a good question. Um, we, we are, San Bernardino County is the primary uh, responding agency uh, in the unincorporated area for, for everything, for structure fires, vegetation fires, medical aids. San Bernardino County Fire, that's who I represent. Cal Fire, the state agency, they staff the fire station next to us during the summer because they have what's called <clears throat> primary SRA responsibility, which is basically just the vegetation in the SRA. So you have LRA, SRA, FRA. There's no way you two entities can work together. We, we do. We, we have master mutual aid agreements. We have mutual threat zones that we, they, they respond to assist us and we respond to assist them. But we, we're at all risk. We primarily respond to everything. They're limited to vegetation responses uh, in the SRA. But they, they work in conjunction with us, and we work in conjunction with them. They're just two separate agencies. They're the state, and we're the county. So 
your outfit is not a taxing authority, but Cal Fire is. They both, both are. Wait, wait. Both are? Yeah, so they, they would. That authority? I'm sorry? Who gives you the authority to tax? I believe it's, um, it's a uh, state statutory allowance. So it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's built into the law for uh, us to, you know, to go through this whole FP5 process um, as long as, you know, we, we submit through LAFCO and um, what we're trying to do is, I, I don't have a lot of information on the FP5. If you're still concerned about um, CAL FIRE's uh, annual fee that they charge uh, property owners that live in the SRA, I can't address that. I don't know where that's going. But the FP5 is to um, ensure continuous funding for our continued operation countywide. And that's... Okay, wait, 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 stop. I don't want to get into that yeah, right yeah. now. It's, it's, That'll it's be a, farther down on the agenda. Thank you, Roger. Okay. <laughs> and he's not, he's not even involved with that. He's, he's yeah. involved with uh, medical aids and fires yeah. and running a crew. Yeah, if you call 911, we'll respond no matter what. The, the, the taxing authority is not with the local jurisdiction. Okay. Is there anything else then? Anything else? Thank you, sir. Thanks, Roger. You owe me. Uh, it looks like Cal Fire's not here, which is uh, probably out fighting fire somewhere in the state. Uh, CSA 29 report. Reese, nice to see you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the community and members of the MAC, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Mark and um, uh, third district staff. Uh, it's nice to be here with you as always. Um, uh, every other month I have uh, this meeting and then a uh, meeting in El Mirage. So I'll stay here as long as I need to uh, for this. But as soon as I'm done, forgive me for running out because I got to get over there. It's by seven is when I'm supposed to be there and I'm not going to make it tonight. So um, just a, a few things to report on, then I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, as usual, uh, Lucerne Valley uh, continues to have some of the most beautiful parks in the county. And uh, just, I try to say that every time because I'm so proud of what our staff does, Zach and the guys that work here, uh, and, and perpetuated on by what the community did to develop those parks over the last 50 or 70 or 80 years or however long it's been. So i um, really proud of our, our parks and what our guys do. Um, uh, cemetery continues to operate um, as normal. I think we are, I think we've done, uh, I think we did 12 burials last year and uh, that's about average. So uh, it's not, we're not having more, but we're not having less either. So that's certainly a worthwhile facility and something that we take pride in as well. Um, uh, we're making continued improvements at Russell Park. Uh, mostly through our relationship with the Mojave Water Agency and the grant money that they provide every year to help us keep doing improvements. Um, uh, we're working on picnic shelter and picnic area improvements this year. And uh, as soon as I have those done, we'll take some pictures and bring them in and show them on the big screen for everybody to see. Or you can just drive by there in a few months and you'll see it yourself, hopefully. Uh, the, in the addition of Russell Park has been a really neat thing for um, the community. And our staff takes a lot of pride in taking care of it. It's very clean. And um, we've had very few instances, I mean like three instances since we've opened it, of significant um, graffiti. So uh, it's, it's not uh, what it was uh, in terms of an eyesore and a, a blight. And we're, we're proud of that. And thank you for all that the community did and the supervisor did to make that happen. Uh, Independence Day event, I think this was our ninth event, uh, last June 30th. Uh, it was June 30th because um, we, uh, instead of being charged 80 or 90 or 100 or 180 or $500,000 for our show, um, Pyro Spectaculars, which is sort of a local company, um, did this year's show for $6,500. So, um, we're, we're lucky that they do that, and um, I like to say that because uh, we certainly couldn't do it if they charged us what they charge everybody else. So um, I don't want that to, to take away from the folks here that donate to make that happen because a lot of uh, businesses and folks in the community um, donate uh, the money to make that possible, and we certainly couldn't do it without them because we don't use your tax dollars to put that show on. 
to be brutally transparent, uh, you know, in the nine years we've done this, if we're trying to raise fourteen thousand dollars or ten, or because the shows have been, you know, the shows have been up to nine thousand in the past, and that's where they were a little bit longer. But um, we've used maybe five hundred, eight hundred dollars sometimes of of CSA uh, twenty nine money, but we don't use much. So, um, and sometimes we've used none. Last year we didn't use any. In fact, last year we raised more money than we needed. So that went over to this year. Um, an update on the solar project, we were th this close to putting it out to bid, and uh, we did a structural, which is lucky that we did this, a structural um, assessment of, uh, this is for Joshua Tree and Lucerne Valley, by the way, of the community centers, and the structural assessment noted that the weight load on these buildings wouldn't suffice uh, for the structural load that those were going to put on the building. And so uh, what I've done is gone back to the contractor, and we're working together to get that rescoped onto parking lot solar only. Um, the good thing about that is uh, that's what we wanted anyway. So the bad thing about it is the reason why we went to a lot of rooftop solar is that's the way it penciled out better for them. I'm hoping that uh, through this renegotiation that uh, we can find a, a middle ground and still do the project. And if we can get parking lot solar here, uh, it'll just add shaded parking and and uh, we'll have the same solar savings that we were. So as soon as I know about that, probably next, next month, I'll be able to report on that as well after these uh, renegotiations are completed. Um, I always try to tell everybody about the Big Bear Zoo project because there's a lot of people in Lucerne Valley that care a lot about that. Uh, it's, uh, I'm the project manager for that, and it's coming along uh, slower than we hoped, but it's coming along fast. So. It's, uh, we're going we're gonna to be opening the zoo Memorial Day weekend next year. So we'll have the brand new facility open, the animals relocated, and um, uh, a beautiful brand new zoo for uh, the, our animals that we can't release, as, as people may or may not know. Uh, the main purpose of the Big Bear Alpine Zoo is the um, rehabilitation and release of uh, injured wildlife that uh, is maybe used as a pet in, some, in a lot of cases. Uh, we got two red foxes last week that people found somewhere that didn't, you know, didn't know, didn't know where the mom was, took them out of the nest, raised them, and then they turned into grown-up red foxes and uh, had to call somebody to get rid of them. Um, Fish and Wildlife um, uh, called us, and of course we accepted them. But because they were pets, they're, we can't release them. And another reason why we can't release them is they're not indigenous to the area. So we can't, we're not allowed to release non-indigenous species. So the only thing we can release are things that are, are, are native to this area. So um, anyways, we've got two new red foxes along with all the other 158 animals we have, including grizzly bears, um, black bears, mountain lions, snow leopards, um, eagles, lots of birds of prey, um, and, and on and on and on. So um, I'll uh, probably... If, if Roger will let me on the agenda, maybe in January or February, I'll do a pictorial presentation of uh, the, new, the new facility. It's scheduled to be finished uh, December 27th. And um, at that point, we take it over and start building the um, inside of the enclosures, um, meaning the, the perches and the stuff that bears play on and all that. Um, and uh, we'll do a, a soft opening probably around uh, May 1st and then do our grand opening um, Memorial Day weekend. And of course, I'll be giving out more information on that. Um, yeah, I'll figure on that for January. That would be great. OK, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes my report. And I would certainly be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. Yes, sir. You say the red foxes, say the red foxes aren't here from the Big Bear Mountains? Well, I, I, I'm not, that's not my, I don't do that for a living, but well, Fish, Fish and Wildlife uh, regulates the tar department, or U.S. Department of Agriculture and Fish and Wildlife is our boss. Well, there used um, to be a fox farm right there on Highway 18 before you get into the town of Big Bear. And well, that guy would go out and trap the foxes and bring them back and breed them. And then when they got too big, then he would, you know, he next, didn't make them pets. Then he would release them. Right. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, 
chasing red foxes out here in the desert, Lucer. Uh, maybe sure maybe the uh, I know of the Fox Farm neighborhood. I lived in that neighborhood, and I I I, re I figured that's why it was called Fox Farm. But the um, uh, Fish and Wildlife mu must have, I'm guessing, deemed that that still doesn't make them indigenous based on his uh, farming of them. That's not probably not the right word. But um, anyway, I, I I don't know why that is, but. You know, if they, they, they do govern what we do, and uh, um, we certainly would rather release animals than keep them, that's, that's for sure. But uh, uh, that's, that's the best answer I can give you. I don't really know why that is. Sorry. Any other questions? I have one. With the wildlife sanctuaries we have here in the CERN Valley, if something would happen to that, would you be able to take over like the lions and the tigers they have down here? Uh, again, that's regulated by uh, federal and state agencies okay. as to what would happen to those, for example. Um, uh, and, 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 uh, and I don't get into this because my heart is way too involved, so I try to stay away from it. Okay, Not I that. Would, I but, was just wondering. But when a bear gets hit on the road, uh, I'd take them all. And unless, of course, unless they're, they passed. But, you know, it, there are bears that get hit in the mountains that we don't get. And uh, to, to answer, I don't know why that is. Um, I, I, and I, it's not really my job to know. But we got our bears mostly from getting hit by cars, and or one that raided a honey, a honey uh, farm, a honey growers thing, but um, several times. But um, uh, I, we get them uh, based on a lot of different. You know, the, we have our Arctic, our Arctic fox, because some guy in Malibu bought it. And then it grew up and turned into a real Arctic fox. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, we have the weirdest stories you could ever have. But we release um, 85 to 90 percent of the animals that we take in. And, uh, we tr and we, it sounds like a really nice thing that we do, and it is. But it's also a function of our zoo's full. So uh, it, we're not trying to take animals um, uh, because we have, we have nowhere to put them. Even at the new zoo, um, we're... we're we're stocked right now, moving every animal we have to the new zoo. Uh, they just have bigger enclosures and a better living space is what that, the answer to that question is. So. It is. Yeah, it'll be open um, probably right up to May 1st, probably. And then we'll probably the last three weeks, the three weeks between that and Memorial Day will probably be closed. So right down the street. So if you're familiar with the news, the, the old zoo, the golf course, it's at, it's, it's leapfrog the golf course and you're there. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Third district, uh, Mark Lundquist, go ahead. I mean, I'm sorry, CSA 29. No, I'm right. <laughs> Third district report, Mark. I don't have anything tonight. You guys have covered it all until we get down to another item or two. Okay, thank you. Uh, Land Use Committee. We have not uh, met for quite a while now, so uh, Cemetery Committee. Cemetery Committee. We haven't done too much on this. I pretty much have been batting my head against the wall. Uh, I, would, I forgot to ask Reese if he had done anything on the report that I wanted to try to combine all three uh, cemetery plots together or, and have someone take it over. But maybe that'll come up for next month, okay? Okay, correspondence. I just got this tonight. It was laying on the desk or table when I got here. It's from uh, Sheriff John McMahon. It says, Roger, thank you for the invite to speak at your MAC meeting. Uh, boy, I can't read this guy's writing. Uh, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity and uh, my goodness. And all you do for, for our community. If you need anything, please call. All right. If I need anything? Yeah. Sounds pretty good. 
All right. Very good. You know, that was a great meeting we had. If you guys weren't here for that meeting with, with the sheriff, it was really good. Yeah. Okay. Um, our non-action item tonight, we had, um, last month we had the discussion of the proposed uh, county fire tax. And um, so I wanted to open up discussion among the board members and then, uh, then to the community. Do we want to take a position on this fire tax? Do we want to oppose it, endorse it, or ignore it? Okay, so if we're going to oppose it, what would be some of the reasons you guys would like to see the reasons for opposing it? No, 3%. Up to three percent. It's tied. It's tied to the inflation index, so it's not automatic. They... It, it, no, it, it can only be tied to the inflation. So if the inflation is one percent, it can only go up one percent. If it goes up, if the inflation is at five percent, it's capped at three percent. So just know that this. If we have a huge spike in inflation. Um, it's capped at three percent currently. So, I'm concerned that we, um, as a community, have indicated at the Levita meeting um, and here that we don't need any more taxes. The gentleman they sent to speak, our new captain for the whole of the county, was wonderful. However, he has nowhere in his presentation did we get a breakdown of how they arrived at the five hundred, I mean, hundred and fifty-four dollars and twenty-seven cents, whatever it is, and we don't know what that $2.3 million that they claim to need is. Um, none of that has been presented to our community, and I think we should take a position to oppose. I agree. OK, so this coming month, I will compose a letter. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Betty. Uh, Microphone. Be an action item at the next meeting. Yes, it'll be an action item, and I'll have a, a letter to draft for your approval. We have to have our protests in by October 16th. True, but whether the protest is successful or not, we still need to let the board know our feeling. Because you know how hard it's going to be to get 25 of the percent of the people to respond. Yeah, it's going to be I impossible. Do. <laughs> if you look at the you look at a map of San Bernardino County, it's, it's all where people don't live. Yeah, you know, for example, our desert property in, in uh, Lanfer Valley, there's four owners, my, my wife's mom, the cousins, and one of them's deceased. So, uh, so my wife's working really diligently to get, you know, the, those four family members to sign off on those two parcels, and the one that's deceased, at least her daughter has a, has a uh, not power of attorney, but executor of her estate. So she, she should be able to, to sign it okay. So it's going to be really difficult. So if, if, it, if we don't get the 25%, it'll go back to the Board of Supervisors, and we'll be there in time with our position on it. So we're working, my wife's working really hard on our parcels, and, and friends of ours that have parcels don't quite understand the, the process. Is anybody here, have you, fought, have you sent your paperwork in yet to, to petition it? Or to, okay, I don't see 25% hands raised. Right there, what's that tell you? There's not 25% of the people in here. Okay, you're going to. Okay, when? Okay, good, because we've got a real short window. Roger, we have a lot of people who do not have access to computers, and we're distributing uh, the instructions and the forms in Johnson Valley, and I understand all over, all over Lucerne Valley, and we need to give them time and tell everybody, you know, That's spread right. the word that these things are available. And as it was pointed out at the HVCC meeting, 
that little envelope doesn't say anything about taxes. If you look at the surface, the front of the envelope when it arrives, and I can imagine that a lot of people, fire protection expansion, eh, put it in the trash. So it doesn't say anything about taxes until you plow through to the second paragraph inside. Well, that's true. But, there, but speaking of that, there's a stack of uh, forms over there on the table. So if, if you know somebody that needs one or you need one, please take one. And if, and if there's any left over, you could probably take them to Johnson Valley if you need more out there. Okay. I want to say they have to be in by the 12th of October. Yeah, October 12th, I believe, is the date. David. Originally, they, they had to vote on this? Yeah, they, they, yeah, because the Board of Supervisors is also the County Fire Board. So they weren't two hats. And I know, I talked to Robert Lovingood, he said he voted against it, so there's only four others could have voted. Did Ramos vote for or against this? Well, he voted for, yes. He, yeah, the supervisor neither opposed this or supported this. He is just giving County Fire the opportunity to make up the shortfall in, in funding, and this is what they came up with. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I don't think it's right that they're only giving us 30 days to do this. They said we had a, a chance to protest this previously, and I had never heard of it before last month's meeting. Secondly, on this paper, besides 25% of the landowners, it also is stating it could also be 25% of the assessed value of the land. So say Mitsubishi signs up, they're going to be a big dollar amount to maybe counteract some of the landowners that are not sending it in. But those landowners, they're going to find out that this tax is more than their property taxes on some of the land. So there's probably going to be a lot of property up for sale. But it is saying it is also the assessed value, 25% of the land available. So if we get a lot of the homeowners to do it, it might make up for some of the property owners not doing it. So it's important to try. Go ahead. Use the microphone. You have one. Don't you guys have one? Um, a majority of the landowners out there, if I remember correctly from some other issues that we have dealt with in the county, are located in Hong Kong in Macau, in China, in any place else but our desert. And I am not real sure exactly how we're going to deal with all of those people who are going to not even understand what we're doing or what's being presented to them. Well, the county is obligated to mail them wherever they are in the world. But what the problem is, is I don't know if they'll have enough time to get it, fill it out and get it back in. So that's a concern. Um, there's a lot of landowners in San Bernardino County, like you said, that don't live in San Bernardino County. They don't live in California. They don't live in the United States. They live all over the world. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm from Lucerne Valley Realty, and I've already got, I don't know, 30, 40 calls of people wanting to sell their land because if you own the far out land, it's not even assessed maybe $100. So this is going to make people dump a lot of property on the market. There is a way to go to the county and ask to have your land reassessed if the assessment is higher than market value. If enough people dump their property, it's not really going to affect people with houses, but vacant land. The, we've just started the last six months selling vacant land and hoping we'll get some you know, single family homes and such. And some people are not going to be able to respond because it doesn't even say you respond by a date. It says it's your responsibility to get them, get this to them by a certain date. That's ridiculous. Postmark is what it should be. 
because then you know you made the date. I mean, I've mailed things from Lucerne Valley to Apple Valley and had it take a week. So you don't know for sure unless you do do it right away. But I'm looking at the number of properties out there and I do not believe there's any possible way you're getting 25% either way unless, um, like uh, she was saying, the, the mines wanted to support it. The mines aren't uh, wanted to oppose it. They're not going to do that because I, I don't believe they're going to want to oppose this. So I just think we're fighting a losing battle. Yes, we want to fight, but there should be more time. And one of the things it says on there is if, if you have like a partnership or um, it's in a corporate name, and there's a lot of big parcels out here in Lucerne Valley that are that way, you have to supply documents proving who's allowed to sign. So most corporations, to do that, you have to have a meeting. And there's not time for that. So there's just so many, so many ways. Whoever wrote this is like, they thought every possible way that they could prevent the 25% from happening. And it's not going to happen. It's just not possible. One comment on the corporate documents. Um, I asked. I, I, they are being responsible on that email address, and I asked them, is the Secretary of State filing okay? Because every corporation has to have that in their file. And they said, yes, that is okay. Well, I know a lot of people trying to meet these requirements. They're really upset about this. But if you own multiple vacant land parcels, it's going to be thousands of dollars for people. It just adds up. And there's a lot of people that just aren't going to get enough time to respond. I think that's a big thing with this. If you're going to say we get a chance to respond, there should be a postmark date and people need longer than, than the time we have. That That's one of the biggest things. Okay, thank you. Chuck. Yeah, don't forget the contiguous parcels, the uh, one time $180 fee, but that's only if the thing gets approved. If you file for that, and therefore all your contiguous parcels, the four or five of them, contiguous to your primary parcel, um, the $108 fee, one time, then all of those parcels are consolidated strictly for the fire tax, you're only paying $157. So people need to know that, the fact is, she is absolutely correct, uh, the county's going to end up with a lot of parcels they don't want. Okay? That's what's going to happen. And Mark, since our supervisor voted to put this thing into motion. What's really important here is what the fire chief told us here, what, two or the last meeting or whatever, that it's not a matter of getting any improvements in your fire protection or your ambulance service. It's trying to maintain what we've got. Okay, so, Mark, this is what Ramos has got to help us. If this thing gets approved, we need a separate process for each community to weigh in as to exactly what is going to be, what the extra money is going to be used for. She needs to, she needs to activate an old fire station that's deactivated. Uh, basically, the fire chief said, well, we probably won't do that. Yeah. But they might go to Yucca Valley and put up, you know, a big, beautiful building, and it measures 67, 80 percent of this is going to salaries and pensions, because that's their biggest expense. So we, the public, need an opportunity, if this thing gets approved, and it might be well, on what our, where our community money goes, because a certain percentage of CSA 29's property taxes, the pay within CSA 29, go to county funds. So Ramos could at least do that for us after he did what he did. Robin. Okay, um, Stand by. Okay, my sister's on vacation now. They won't be back until probably mid-November. They haven't even got the paper yet. I was lucky enough to get this. And traveling around the states, how am I gonna get this to her to sign? You know, I'm just a, actually a renter, you know? Who's, who's collecting her mail? Her daughter. Can her daughter fax it to her wherever they're at, or I'm sorry, scan it and email it? No, that's, that's what I'm saying. They're going 
Now, I'm going to text her tonight and tell her the situation. Now, can I sign it? Even Absolutely I not. Okay, see, that's what I wanted to ask. Unless you have power of attorney or, or executor of their estate, but they're still alive, so you wouldn't But they're the both the executor or whatever the state is my brother-in-law. Say again? My brother-in-law is the other person's on there, not me. Everybody on it has to sign it. Right. Yeah, if okay. husband and wife, you own, joint owners on the property, both have to sign it. In the case of our property on the desert, we have four family members, one in Canada, two in Paso Robles, and then uh, one here in the Cern Valley. So okay. they're all over the place. Okay. Well, in other words, it's just going to be like, she's going to be out of it because by the time it's time to mail it in, she'll be maybe home. You said October what? 12th, I think it is. 12th. She won't even be here. I can't, you know, I don't know. What do you want me to do? Yeah, I can't, okay. You know. It's just, um, there's a gentleman. Let me get this gentleman up here first. Go ahead. Yes, my uh, my daughter and her husband own, own two pieces of property uh, on Clark, and they received six notices. So what I told them to do is go ahead and fill them out and uh, send them all back. Each one does a protest. For every letter you get, do a protest. Do a protest on every letter you get. I got two notices. I sent in two, two no, uh, responses, and... Uh, I'm going to advise the Lions Club tonight to uh, do the, exactly the same thing. For every every letter you get, send in a response because I think they're trying to snowball everybody with a lot of paperwork. And uh, if, if we can get it, however we can get it, however we can get it, we need to do it. Okay. Um, the lady in the rear. The, um one of the issues is the only way you can get the protest letter if you don't know somebody around here is you have to go on the internet. A lot of the owners, it, it seems crazy, but there's plenty of people that do not use the internet. So my office is giving out, you know, we're sending them to them, we're talking to them about it. But um, the other thing, what he said, I know of about 12 people have told me so far that they got multiple letters for various parcels. So if they're not together enough to send us one letter per parcel, we're having to trust their counting for the 25%. It's kind of, uh, I just like go back to, I just don't think there's a chance of this. County, county has hired, in defense of the county here, they've hired an outside company to, to handle all this. So it's not county employees counting ballots and throwing every other one away. It's a, it's a private company. Uh, this gentleman up here was first. Hold on, wait for the microphone. I think every square foot of San Bernardino County is taxed in one way or another. I don't think we're getting the full scoop from down below of what they really collect. I don't think there's a spot of land in this huge county that doesn't pay some kind of tax. Well, that's absolutely true. Um, Brian. Yeah, I don't think the BLM pays taxes on their land. And they have lots of land in San Bernardino County. Um, my question is, I don't know if anybody knows or not, if I pay the $108 to co-join my contiguous properties, uh, am I going to get reassessed? Because my, my, value, my value on my property has gone up since I purchased it. No. It's my understanding the answer is no, but it's a real quick phone call to the assessor's office to ask them. Okay, Bill. As Chuck mentioned, we all pay part of our tax, property taxes are already for the fire. It's like many things, when we first moved to Lucerne Valley, there was a fire district. Part of our taxes went just to that. And the government told us, like you've heard on, from many governments, well, that's in a inefficient. We're going to put all the money in the general fund. But don't worry, we're going to pay the bills. And now, I mean, we've heard this on other department expenses. Now we're hearing it on this. And it's just, it doesn't 
to me, it's crooked. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean conspiracy theory crooked. I mean someone's decided, okay, the state is overspending, they're bankrupt, so they hold back money from the county because they're paying all these high wages and retirement systems that are not sustain sustainable. Now, ah, I'm not supposed to talk. <laughs> now the county is saying, well, we used to take our tax dollars and pay for the fire service. Uh, we've got too many expenses that are growing out of control. And personally, I think we just have to put down our feet and refuse. And tricky is great mic. At the store, I brought it up to several customers today, some of who are, were in, have been in this room tonight, and they said they got the letter. They didn't realize it was anything about this. And some have thrown them out. You know, it's just, and I told them, well, we have copies right up here in the front, but yeah, the chance of getting 25, we really want 50% plus. So this thing gets defeated. Fat chance, but uh, we shouldn't just roll over. We've got to stop this. And they say, well, only property owners can do it on paper. Well, we're going to have to tell them how it's going to get decided. We can't just be dictated to. Okay, I think we'll close the comments right there this morning and run a little later. Um, under council members' requests and reports, I, I did want to bring up one thing. Um, Supervisor James Ramos is running for office uh, for assemblyman down in the Redlands, somewhere down the hill. Highland, Redlands, somewhere, it's all down there. Um, so if he, if he wins, he's a pretty popular guy, if he wins, um, the MAC will immediately be dissolved. I want you guys to understand that. Um, and then the council will have to appoint an interim uh, supervisor to fill in. Did Chuck leave? Because I want him to get that job. Um, an interim supervisor to fill in until the next election. Um, and so it would be up to that supervisor if he wanted to reinstate the MAC. So um, I don't know. Uh, Mark will probably be out of a job and Mary will be out of a job. Um, whenever there's, because we all serve at the pleasure of the, of the, of the supervisor. So just keep your heads up. We may not have a MAC here in a couple months. But that may be temporary either, I don't know. And then I don't know if they'll want all of us back on again. They probably wouldn't want me back on, but you never know. Yeah. <laughs> Betty. I want, I want to tell everybody that Johnson Valley is having their Oktoberfest on October 13th. It's a Saturday. And the beer garden opens at 3 o'clock. And admission is $8. That buys your wonderful buffet dinner. If you buy your ticket before the 28th of September, and you can get the ticket online at johnsonvalley.com. And it's a wonderful time. We have nine homebrew craft brews and two hard ciders made with water from the Johnson Valley KBI and well. That's the best news, huh? It's going to be fun. So everybody come. Eat a lot. Test all the different beers. They're all different. Beers. We have samplers for you to try. And souvenirs. We have souvenirs too. If anybody wants to take a poster, they can. Unfortunately, I don't have any tickets, but I have some big posters. Board members, do you have anything else? Okay. Uh, our next meeting is October 18th at 5 p.m. Uh, here at the Community Center. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned at 6.57. Thank you all for coming, and thank, thank you all for your input.